It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, Lydia Kabraki. Lydia Kabraki is a Noah Harding Professor of Computer Science uh, and Bioengineering and the director of the Ken Kennedy Institute at Rice University. Lydia's research uh, is uh, in enabling autonomy of robots working with and in service of human and also uh, applied AI applied to medicine. Uh, she has numerous contributions to the field and as a young roboticist, um, I did learn about some of the most uh, prominent uh, contributions that she's had to the field, including the probabilistic roadmaps, which is interestingly an elegant uh, and simple enough solution, which you could introduce to like an introductory robotics group, and it's still powerful enough that it can actually deploy them to the most complicated robotic system, right? Um, so that was really fascinating to me, and it's great to, uh, to meet Lydia in person. Uh, because of her many contributions to the field, she's been uh, extremely well recognized. She has received many numerous awards, including the ACN Grace Murray uh, Hopper Award, the ACM Athena Award, and the ACN AAAI uh, Alan Newell Award. It's our pleasure to have Lydia present the keynote at the inaugural chair of the event. So I'll hand it over Thank to you. Lydia. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm really honored to be here, and I would like to thank the organizers for putting this together. And I hope it will be an opportunity for us to meet on a regular basis, exchange ideas, learn from each other. So um, my job here is to wake you up, and I intend to wake you up in the next half an hour. Half hour. So um, I will take uh, this uh, opportunity to talk about research that has been happening in my group over uh, the last few years, and I will tell you about our successes and our challenges. Um, to, to get started, I hope you will agree with me that recently we've seen robots do amazing specific tasks, right? And I'm showing it to you here, the AI hand, or, you know, the coordinated summer slots of the uh, Boston Dynamics robots. Wow, amazing, right? Uh, automation has uh, entered the warehouses, manufacturing is clear. But what is happening about our progress for robots for general tasks? There, I don't think we are that advanced. And one of the things that we would like to do in our group is, is work towards this goal. Um, being close to NASA, we've been inspired by their changes. So here is uh, one example that uh, inspired us. Uh, NASA built Roponaut 2, uh, which you see in this uh, picture here, in this slide here, to fetch cargo bags. I mean, it seems like an easy task, right? The cargo bags are stored in the space station. It's not a completely uncontrolled environment. It's a very controlled environment. Uh, this robot um, needs to, to fetch these cargo bags. And I think this problem is really archetypical of the complexity of commanding a robot. So uh, using the amazing uh, um, uh, animations of uh, my student, Zach Kingston, who is uh, here, um, uh, uh, you have this robot that needs to always hand on, uh, um, uh, hold on a handrail, right? Because it's up in the space and it will float if it's not holding to something, and get close to the cargo bag and uh, 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 remove the restraint and get the cargo bag and hold it tight because you don't want this cargo bag to fall out in space. And that would complete the task, okay? Well, great, all right, but how do you get all this done? And here's another example. You have a janitor robot, you want this robot to do things in some order, avoiding the black area because the demo is happening there. You want it to water the plant, clean the blackboard, turn off the copy maker, pick up the vacuum cleaner. I mean, your wish list, your wish list here. And there's, there may be temporal constraints, okay? Do this and then do that. How do we get to closer to commanding a robot uh, doing um, a task like this? So we, we term this the task and motion planning problem. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, it's a very nice platform, a very nice uh, paradigm to think about meaningful interaction of perception, stated estimation, planning, and control. And uh, I think it, uh, at least for us, and I hope to convince you that uh, uh, this, is, this is a good idea, it has helped us a lot uh, look at uh, topics like learning, uh, like formal methods and their role in robotics, uh, symbolic reasoning and its role in robotics. And uh, uh, it also has given us, a, again, a framework to think about modularity, which in my opinion is something extremely important if we want robots for general tasks. I mean, what is modularity? How do we get to that? And to think about abstractions. And I will go and, and I will talk about abstractions and representations multiple times in my talk, because for us at least, they made a huge difference in whether we can do things or not do things. 
Uh, and uh, uh, by working on these different issues, we get to uh, a longer horizon tasks for robots and uh, eventually to uh, semi-autonomous or autonomous systems. Okay, so let me get, this, uh, get started. Uh, part one of my talk is I'll, I'll give you some background on my group. I'll uh, talk about some recent projects and I'll do that uh, to, uh, to show you where we are coming from. This is going to be a short part, about uh, five minutes, uh, and then uh, I'm going to um, talk about uh, task and motion planning, all right? So for the first part, okay, for the first part, uh, as uh, Joy Deep said, we are a group that has a deep expertise in motion planning. So sampling-based planners for high-dimensional problems, besides the probabilistic roadmap, um, planners that work with geometric and dynamic constraints, with manifold constraints, uncertainty, and sensing and action, multiple agents. Uh, and also, we are a group that supports a lot the design, implementation, and dissemination of software that will enable others to do things that have not been done. Uh, by, by us or anybody else. So um, here is uh, one of the posters that uh, we will be presenting outside today is by Konstantinos Hamzas, who is sitting over there. And he is looking at how to use an experienced database to, hi to guide high dimensional uh, planners for difficult tasks. So he stores, and he can tell you how, uh, problems and experiences in a database that he retrieves uh, once he's given a new problem instance, that is a new workspace, a new start and a goal, and uses this the retrieved solution to find quickly a new solution. And he has uh, worked a lot on retrieval functions, both manually and also he has learned retrieval functions. So talk to him. Another poster that we will be presenting uh, today by Carlos Quintera, Pena, who is also here, uh, over over there, uh, uh, working with Costandinos and also with Professor Angel Carr at uh, uh, Rice, uh, looks at the problem of human guidance uh, in partially observable, uh, observable environments. So here is a case: we have a human that has a very good perception of, of the world uh, she moves in. Uh, you can see it on the right, but the robot does not, as we all know. Okay, does not have the same kind of perception. So uh, how do we use um, a planning? Uh, um, uh, to, um, uh, to propose, let's say, solutions to the human, the human critiques these solutions, and then how do we use inversion reinforcement learning to converge to solutions that are robust for the environment where the human is working. Uh, and uh, uh, to, to finish, uh, the third part that I wanted to uh, discuss is uh, motion planning with manifold constraints. So Zach Kingston finished his PhD on, on this problem, inspired by the robot problem. Uh, you can see here the robot turning a valve and pushing a door open. Okay, this is planning for a high dimensional system, but with manifold constraints. Um, and and uh, of course, there are many planners for this if you look at the literature. But what Zach did is that instead of changing the planners to, uh, to, to work with manifold constraints, he endowed the search space with operations that support uh, what sampling place pl uh, planners need. So you can take any sampling place planner and use it to plan with manifold constraints, allowing you to choose the, the right planner for the right job. And once you understand, of course, how to plan with one manifold constraint, with one constraint, the question becomes, what if you have multiple of them? Okay, can you sequence them? Can you transition from constraint to constraint? Remember my discussion about modularity. And he actually showed, this, is, this uh, animation here is the robot uh, again, uh, uh, holding onto different handrails to get to its destination. But we don't tell the planner where, what uh, to grasp or where to grasp. Okay, the planner automatically decides that. And how does it decide that? I mean, this is a, a very a structured reasoning, I would say, a reasoning about modes and mod families. So each grasp of the handrail is a mod. All the possible grasps define a mod family. And Zach developed multimodal planning, finding paths that transition between modes within mod families. And I hope my, uh, uh, this, uh, anime, this uh, uh, picture here shows you what is happening. You are moving on one manifold, let's say the purple manifold, until you can transition to another manifold, the green one, and follow the green manifold. But how to do that when you have many constraints is what Zach managed to do. So talk to him if you want during the breaks for, for this, uh, this work. And as I said before, we really believe that we should be distributing our software and helping others work with the tools that we have developed and, and make them better. Really, the OMPL library, when it started, it was five, six, seven maybe planners that we implemented, but we gave it a very good structure. And then it was really the community that, uh, that uh, contributed back 
right, contributed back uh, to this, uh, uh, the different sampling based planners. So it's not only PRM and RRT, right? There are lots of different planners and you need to understand which one to use. And this library implements all of them. So um, not from our work, but also contributions of many other people that uh, we acknowledge in our webpage. It has more than 2,000 users. If you need planning for a high dimensional system, check it out. And this is not the only thing that we uh, are uh, uh, behind and we are trying to, to do our best to maintain. Planner Arena uh, gives you um, a way to benchmark uh, different motion planning algorithms because as you all know, they don't have the same performance. Uh, and for the, the job that you have, you need to understand what, you, uh, what planner to use. Hyperplan is a newer work. It's a framework for uh, uh, helping you select an algorithm, but also optimize the parameters of these algorithms. And uh, those of you who have used the randomized algorithms know that if you tune, uh, don't tune a little bit the parameters, the performance is terrible. So uh, here's some help on how to, to, to work with this. Motion Benchmaker uh, helps uh, generate benchmark problems and different uh, uh, data sets, which is becoming increasingly interesting now that we are talking about learning methods and, and how to use simulation. And finally, RoboFlex, uh, um, which is really work again of John Kingston. Um, it's robot uh, motion planning made easy with movie made easy. Okay, this is a good title for what RoboFlex is. So these are things that we have developed over the years. We are trying to support. We would welcome your involvement. It is a community effort. Uh, it's not only our effort. All right. So I'm done with what I wanted to, to say about uh, uh, some background uh, for our lab more during the um, poster session. Let me now talk about work on task and motion planning. Uh, so here is, uh, as an example, I have several cans on the table and I want to instruct the robot to pick up the cans, to uh, put them on this uh, tray and then to push the tray. Uh, so there are a number of discrete uh, 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 things that need to be decided. Okay, what do you do first? What do you do next? Um, and uh, then they need to be sequenced uh, the properly, the robot, uh, uh, the robot motions need to be planned. Uh, there is a discrete part, as you see, finding the, the task and there is a continuous part finding the motion and then putting everything together. And in this case, we are just interested about one plan that will solve the problem. But in our work, we've, taught, we've actually, for over several years, um, uh, and, uh, uh, investigated how to find both paths for solving task and motion planning and policies for task and motion planning. And I will explain the difference between the two. We've used temporal logics um, uh, for, for paths. We've used actually synthesis uh, formal methods, temporal logics for the uh, for obtaining policies. I will start uh, by discussing obtaining paths. Uh, as I described before, the task and motion planning problem, a, a, a discrete part, I mean, some kind of a structure, a discrete structure on which you do the task planning, and then a continuous component. And yes, I know there are extremely good techniques for solving each of them, but the question here is how do you put them together? And how do you put together them together is something that not only us, but several people over the years have tried to do. So I will tell you about some of our successes and some of the things that we find difficult. Um, one of the uh, approaches that has worked for us well when finding paths is the following. Um, we uh, keep some kind of a weighted graph structure, I will tell you how, uh, that encodes um, the uh, specification. Um, we use, in this case, um, in this slide, I have COSAFE LPL, Linear Temporal Logic. I will tell you what this is. Uh, we have some abstraction of our robot in our environment. We encode this in our weighted graph. Um, we find the task plan. We try to implement it using sampling-based motion algorithms. Doing only that does not, is not enough. You have to have a, a feedback loop to, if you fail, I mean, what do you do? How do you adjust things? Um, uh, but this is, uh, this is a short description of how this work goes. So you have linear temporal logic uh, um, propositions next until eventually uh, is what is supported by COSAFE LTL. Why did we use COSAFE LTL? Because you can take it and trans uh, transform it into a finite deterministic automaton. That in, and this automaton will encode all the valid prefixes of the linear temporal for, formula. So for computer scientists like me, this is wonderful, okay? This is great news. Um, a, a structure I know how to manipulate that encodes my uh, specification. And let me do also an abstraction of the environment. Now, if you have a mobile robot, the abstraction of the environment may be just adjacency. 
uh, moving, you know, in a building, a density of rooms, but for a manipulator, it's something different. I'm not going to, to get into how you get abstractions from manipulators, an open problem, in my opinion. Uh, you take a cross product, and here is your, your graph, initially weighted with the same weights, but you, st you start uh, uh, searching these graphs to find how to get from, let's say, your initial position to your final, which is always a double circle here. And if you succeed, that's great, you have found a solution. But if you don't succeed, you look for another, um, you look for another way to get to your goal. But in the meantime, you keep the memory of the fact that you did not succeed with the previous edge, okay, with this edge. And you weight your graph accordingly. And we found that this weighting is extremely important for getting uh, complex things done. And we could, using some like uh, planners, uh, get an estimate of the motion planning difficulty by finding how much progress was done in our space and projecting that to a lower dimension space. But there are many ways of doing that. For us, this, 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 this uh, paradigm worked well. And once it worked well, we said, wow, now we can put uncertainty in sensing, in action. Now we can uh, put uh, partially unknown environments. It's, uh, Failing executions, Tian Yang uh, uh, Pan, who is here, uh, will be presenting a poster where he shows a case where you have a robot, let's say, manipulating these uh, uh, objects on the table, and uh, the lower the lens by um, the manipulation that it's doing, if uh, some are, I mean, obviously these objects are not easy to grasp, okay, and it fails all the time, it keeps this information by sampling posterior transition probabilities, and it keeps this information in an MDP, and does the motion plan, the task and motion planning with this MDP, converging to more robust solutions if it's given the same scenario again and again. All right. Um, but what I'm going to, to do in the, in the last part of this talk is, is uh, uh, discuss what happens with tax and motion planning when you have an uncontrollable agent. And uh, this is uh, uh, the second part of uh, the work that we've done on task and motion planning. And uh, in this case, we find policies. And who is the uncontrollable agent? Typically, a human. Okay, the human is the per <laughs> entity that you cannot really control, right? And we do want robots that work with humans, okay? We want these robots out of the cages, we want them closer to humans, but you know humans are unpredictable, all right? Humans may help, humans may be malicious, humans may be lazy, okay, and do nothing, and still you want your task done. So what, uh, how do you deal uh, with this case? Um, here, uh, let me make sure that we all understand the uh, difference between plans and, and policies. You know, plan is what I show on the left. You have a way to go from your initial to your goal. Uh, policy is a very different thing, right? Okay, for policy, you want to know what to do under many different uh, circumstances. And in this case, when you have an uncontrollable human, uh, you want to go towards policies, right? You want to have a, a better understanding of what could possibly happen in your environment. So what is our goal here? We have some tasks to accomplish. We have some abstract model of actions that the robot can take and possible outcomes, and some abstract model of the human. And what do we want to output? We want actions to complete a task according to some criteria of optimality. We can do that with replanning. Yes, it has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, a disadvantage could be runtime latency if you're not careful. We have contingency planning. Yes, you can do that, but you have to think about all these contingencies. And we said we wanted to uh, investigate reactive synthesis, okay, for formal methods. It provides kind of a structured framework to reason about the things that can happen in your space. All right. So we use reactive uh, synthesis for the problem that I'm uh, discussing. Really, what you are doing is uh, the, the reactive synthesis uh, is, 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 is reduces to a game. So the players are the robot and the human. The game rules is the planning domain and abstraction that you need there. And I will get to that again. A winning condition is a ta your task. And the strategy that guarantees that the robot wins is the strategy that guarantees task completion. Okay, so we have a huge uh, theory to draw from, the theory of the, from, from synthesis and reactive synthesis. Now, if we go with reactive synthesis, there are two things that we have to be careful about. The domain abstraction and the specification of the task. And we want a policy, as I said, that will guarantee task completion. Okay. Abstractions. Okay, abstractions. How do you abstract this space when you have a manipulator? Okay, you have a task and you have a manipulator. The, yes, you can think about the... Um, uh, 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 nodes, let's say, of this of your abstraction graphs being the locations of your objects. 
And the edges will be of two kinds, the human actions and the robot actions. Um, and uh, uh, you, you have to make some assumptions, okay? You cannot work with a general case. So the assumptions that we made is that the human cannot move an object out of the robot's workspace. The human can hold, not hold an object indefinitely. The human has a bounded number of moves because if you give it unbounded numbers, you know, it can always undo what the robot does and you'll never be done. And uh, the robot is uh, uh, the robot is modeled in a standard PDD. I'll be pick and place the domain here. Finding this abstraction automatically is a lot of work. Okay, and uh, we have a paper that discusses how you can get an abstraction like this for a manipulator. But uh, assuming that you have this kind of abstraction, we have uh, a nice uh, uh, logic that can give us, um, a, a, again, a finite automaton um, that uh, tells us, you know, how we can accomplish this uh, particular task. Uh, now I will tell you, I will jump, you know, to um, what we can do and by showing you this video. So the, the goal here is to uh, build an arc, okay? This arc has two black bo blocks as support two white blocks a support and a black top uh, block on the top okay so this is this is the task and uh, uh, you see that the robot here managed to accomplish the task now i'm going to show you this video again and i want you to uh, look at the human okay see what the human is doing in this environment all right so here we go again oops here we go again hopefully I hope it's going to run. Just a okay. Here, the human helped. Okay, it put a, a, a correctly placed a black box, but here the human hurts the task by taking a white block away. Nevertheless, the robot has a policy to be able to fix things, let's say, and accomplish the task. So this is what sim reactive symbol uh, what uh, symbolic reactive synthesis gives us, um, and it's it's very interesting to to, to play these games. Okay, it's uh, yeah, but how do you get there? In order to do synthesis, you know, you need to do symbolic synthesis. Otherwise, you have an explosion. Okay, huge explosion. It just doesn't work. Uh, well, symbolic synthesis, fortunately, we found out, works very nicely for robotics domains. We have the, both our transition diagram and our DFA can be uh, are represented with Boolean variables, and, and our com the computations that we do really are uh, Boolean functions as set. And we can um, represent the things nicely in the way that you know symbolic synthesis would expect things. I don't know if you've heard about BDDs, but BDDs uh, uh, compactly uh, represent Boolean functions as sets. So here is an example. Actually, I got it from Wikipedia. This said, you know, you can compact everything that is the same uh, uh, and, and, and reduce the space uh, and the operations that you do on, on this particular structure. And for robotics, you know, symbolic synthesis makes a lot of sense to me. And remember, I told you about representations at the beginning. I told you about abstractions and that we need to care about this, these things in our work. So uh, let me give you an example to illustrate why symbolic synthesis and symbolic uh, um, uh, analysis this makes sense for robotics. So here, the robot needs to grasp a cylinder. We don't care which cylinder, right? Just the cylinder. We can deal with all states explicitly, right? Well, that's fine, but if you have a thousand of these states, what do you do? However, we can group equivalent states together. So in this case, the only state variable that we care about is that some cylinder is in the gripper. That's it. I mean, I don't care about the rest. So what I can do is that I can um, see all of these three options, uh, all these uh, three options as an equivalent. So this is the symbolic representation that I'm discussing. And we were successful, actually, in, uh, uh, in exploiting this idea. It was uh, difficult at the beginning for us to, to, to switch our mindset, but we were able to uh, represent our domain symbolically. Um, also, there is a whole theory about how to represent um, uh, specifications, uh, how to go to from uh, uh, from specifications to symbolic automata. So we use this work, and uh, we um, uh, uh, represent it. We worked very, very, very carefully with the abstractions of our planning domain. Um, we had uh, also LTLF specification. LTLF is LTL over, over finite traces. Finite traces because usually we're interested in, in construction tasks. We, we wanted something that is finite. Um, we got again a symbolic uh, representation uh, using a tool uh, uh, called Mona. I mean, we didn't we didn't write that, but then we managed to work with uh, uh, symbolic representations and solve the game. And as a result, uh, we ha you have uh, the videos that I showed to you before. Okay.
So uh, it, it uh, um, forced us, you know, this work on task and motion planning to think about representations, to think about abstractions, to think about how to put together things, uh, how to deal with discrete components, continuum, continuous components. And as you will see for, from the posters, how to insert different things like learning and, and, and uh, um, uh, different kinds of reasoning. All right, so I will finish now by telling you that once we got these results, of course, we were um, curious, what else can we do? How far can we uh, push this? And we've moved from reactive synthesis now to probabilistic synthesis. So reactive synthesis was very nice, uh, but still the model of the world is inaccurate. Um, and we want to go closer and closer to world models that are, um, reflect the reality. And we want to keep and eventually improve scalability of our techniques. And scalability is a big thing if you're not careful with your representations. Before I told you that our abstractions had here uh, two kinds of edges, uh, the human actions and the robot actions. Well, um, think about it in a different way. You can have the human here and you can assign probabilities to the different actions that the, the human or the robot can do, right? So uh, here, let's, let's talk about the robot here. Um, here is a robot, I mean, maybe with a 0.7% 7, 7 uh, um, oh, chance to get to this state, 20% uh, chance to get to another state. So in this way, you can model environmental disturbances and human disturbances. Um, why do we want to go to a model like this? Let me um, justify it to you. Well, you're working with a human, right? You may be working with a, an adversarial human. You may be working with a helpful human, right? You may be working with somebody who actually wants to help this, this robot get the task done, or the robot helping the human get the task done. This is illustrated a little bit in this slide. So here is the case where we have an adversarial human. And the robot could try to build, okay, do whatever it needs to do away from the human, minimizing the chances that this human will interfere. But if uh, uh, we have a helpful human, then the robot may try to build things, to build this arc that I'm uh, working with in this example, close to the human, so that the human increases, we increase the chances of the human actually helping finish the, this task. Um, and uh, um, this, uh, so this is stylized uh, a little bit in, in this example. And I will be talking for the rest of my slides with you know building an arc with these uh, three uh, blocks. Uh, in order to get to probabilistic synthesis, again, you need a good abstraction. And here is my domain. Let me define my domain. Uh, here is the arc I want to build. Uh, the numbers are the locations, two, three, and four. This is my gripper. Okay, the gray is the gripper. Zero um, is a location in the gripper. And location one is the else location, everything that is not shown. Um, and when I want to describe a state, here is how I describe the state. The colors show where the two uh, blocks are. So here is a transition diagram that uh, formalizes uh, what the, the robot can do. So for example, for this state, the robot may decide to pick the uh, blue uh, uh, cylinder from the else region and stack it. And in that case, we're done. We can assign probabilities in this. Okay, so for example, here, there may be a chance that 90% uh, chance that the robot will stack the, the cube and we are done, or a 10% chance that the robot does nothing, okay, and we stay, we remain in the same state. Okay, we can do the same thing for the human. Actually, we in our work, we assume that this is given to us. But uh, for example, this means that we have a human starting, let's say, in this state, maybe with 50%, let's say 15% chance it stacks the, 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 um, the blue box and we are done. Uh, taking all this together, you can uh, get to something that we call the manipulation MDP that encodes all this information, plus other extra things that I didn't talk about, uh, as uh, whose turn it is and uh, how often do you check uh, for changes in the environment. And then you go again to you know, solving this MDP. But in order to do that, you need to, to worry about your representations, you need to worry about your abstractions. You know, we worked again with this idea of BDDs, uh, in order to be able to use, to use tools that can actually deal with the complexity of the manipulation domain. Remember, it's not a mobile robot here, it's a, a manipulator, all right? It's a manipulator who would uh, hide the degrees of freedom. Uh, so we managed again to do the same kind of representation and also worry about uh, variable ordering because synthesis, you know, can assign uh, values to to variables randomly, but we have a robotics domain, okay, this is a CAN, and the CAN needs to be here on the table. So we worked with the encodings, you can find uh, this in our papers, and we found actually that there are encodings that make sense for robotics and can help us 
um, uh, solve the, the problem that uh, um, I uh, discussed at the beginning. So here is an example with an adversarial human. The robot does not expect the human to uh, help, so it builds an arc far away from the human. In the second case, the robot expects the human to help, so it doesn't do anything with this white block. It leaves it where it is and lets the human help it complete the task closer to the human. Okay, I'm done. Uh, part two is completed. What I wanted to say, I'm going to go back now to my slide saying that we use the task emotion planning problem to talk about meaningful interaction of perception, state estimation, planning and control. We use this uh, uh, domain to, uh, uh, to, to understand the role of symbolic greenhousing, formal methods and learning. We try to understand modularity, we try to understand abstractions and uh, Ken uh, uh, Limelech, who is a, a postdoc in our group and who is somewhere here, yes, will be giving a talk about our um, initial uh, effort uh, uh, to understand the task emotion planning skills. Um, and I think, as I said before, that this can help us go to long horizon tasks and move towards it on. I will finish here by thanking the students who did this work because I did not do this work, I'm just presenting it. Um, a number of students have been involved in the topics that I discussed. A number of collaborators have been involved in the tasks uh, that I have been, uh, discussed, um, our fund, uh, funding agencies. And I will close by thanking all of you for your attention. Thank you very, very much. Okay, all right, we have some questions. I'm curious, um, a lot of your past work was in emotion planning. Yes. And you're talking about um, past emotion planning and all the instances you gave were going to take a couple of years. Yes. Um, so I guess my, my question is, where do you see a role for past emotion planning in early navigation tasks? And if so, would it be that would you use the same techniques exactly, or is like should we be separating past emotion planning from manipulation? Mm. No, I'm not separating them. I think uh, um, I, I think we have a particular expertise in uh, uh, working with high dimensional systems that other groups do not have. That's why we focused on this case. Um, but uh, no, I don't see them separately. Uh, actually, I think there are unifying, unifying themes that uh, will be used. It will be the same if you have a mobile robot, it will be the same if you have a, a manipulator. Um, and there are people like, you know, let me mention Hadas, Hadas Chris Gazit, who is working with um, a reactive synthesis, for example, with mobile with uh, mobile robots, and and it's showing similar. I mean, she's getting to similar observations than the ones that we are getting to, and it's very very interesting to see. So I think there are underlying principles that can be used uniformly. We chose to uh, to focus in uh, with manipulators because I think there are very very few groups that who understand how to do uh, the motion planning for the, in this kind of cases, and uh, we understand also abstractions. And uh, um, for this, with these kinds of systems, I think to, to an extent that can help this problem. Absolutely. observation is that the, the balance between how long it takes to do the planning versus execute. Yes. It could be much longer, and so that can get you into very interesting problems. Yes, very interesting problem. I didn't get into this at all. But you see, th this is extremely important, right? If you have a budget uh, for the timing, or if you want things to be done at certain points, then you have to insert much more than I described in this talk. And I would be very happy to talk to you about this. Yes. Uh, so, so you're following on the previous slide. Um, you start with full facial motion, so we have a manipulation. As you go to mobile robot integration, so if you look at novel way in, um, have you thought about vehicles that have more dexterity, like the, the systems we call the active systems, where we're able to body with full six space? Uh, the navigation problem is actually like docking. Yeah, we have not, but I think this is a very interesting case. Yes, we have not gotten into that. Luis. Yes, yeah, so the connection to uh, monitoring the control and you know, that can yes. allow you to sort of you know, predict and, and you know, something based approaches could be great uh, uh, for uh, for kind of uh, you know hallucinating the future or, or yes. predicting the future and and in connection to both task and motion planning and perhaps even give feedback. I know it's a big problem. The, the dual you know 
inside the communications where the, the execution layer can give um, can give sort of a prediction um, a score to the to either the task or the motion planner. So I wonder if that's areas that you're investigating having some sort of robustness and real timeness yes. of these. So uh, of we these, want uh, to get there. We are still not there. <laughs> we want to get there. And I think you have a very good point there, Luis. OK, um, but uh, um, I cannot tell you that we have work going on in this uh, uh, in this domain right now. Uh, but I think the, the connection with modern predictive control is, is going to be critical, you know, for deploying this, uh, these things in, in, in the real world. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Lydia, okay, for this uh, wonderful talk and uh, started saying lots of discussions we hope to continue yes, these discussions i would love um, to and this is why i structured the talk in this way i hope to generate some discussion and i would love to uh, and my students are here and we would love to hear your comments so let's thank lydia thank again you.